We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Get to down. Any questions you want to direct or anything like that? They need to go through. Colossians 1, 9 and 10. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Since Paul found out that their lives had turned around for the better, he had not stopped praying for them. Okay, so that's point number one is, don't stop praying for what's working. Don't stop praying for what's working. I'm telling you, like 90% of the prayer requests that I've ever experienced in my whole life have had to do with problems, things going wrong, things that are broken, people who are sick, people who are lost, people who are hurting. Paul says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. So obviously we're supposed to pray about everything, but this is so amazing. This is, to me, a brand new thought. Since I've, the other day the Lord actually asked me that question. He asked me, what's working? And so I started to make a list on my whiteboard of things that I'm involved in in my life that I sense his blessing on, that I sense are really effective. In fact, it was like, okay. By the time I was done, I thought, man, everything I touch grows. Everything I touch turns green. Everything I touch starts to look more like the kingdom. Ah, oh, it started to really deeply encourage me. But, but that's, that's, that's principle number one. Don't stop praying for what's working. Instead of always worrying about and focusing on and praying for problems, 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 why don't you figure out what is God blessing? What is God doing? Where is the Holy Spirit at work? Who's interested? Who's hungry? You know, and pray for what's, pray for God to do more. Don't stop praying for God to do more of what's working. Joke break. Today at the bank, a lady asked me to check her balance, so I pushed her over. Seemed to be working pretty poorly. Next little chunk of scripture. He says, we ask God to give you. Since we found out about this, we haven't stopped asking God to give you, and he's about to say two things. We'll get into that later, but here's the point. The first thing he did when he found out that they got saved was, he did the main thing. God's the answer. God is the answer. God's the answer. God's the one who has the answers. God's the one who has the power. God's the one who has solutions. God's the one who's sovereign and can orchestrate things. God's the one who can transform hearts, lives, and minds. God's the miracle worker. God's the one working behind the scenes, and God's the one, if you have eyes to see it, is working in the scene. God's the answer. God has the grace they need, the peace they need, the wisdom they need, the help they need, the hope they need, right? He has the people they need. He has the financial resources they need. He has the healing. He has everything we need. He has the perspective we need. And so Paul says, since I found out, I haven't stopped asking God. And if, because if God's the one with it, then what do we do? We ask. Why? Because he's generous. So we ask God. We ask God. Joke break. You know, I always say that you should never criticize someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes because that way, by the time you're criticizing them, you're a mile away. And I think this is the most important part. You got their shoes. <laughs> First thing Paul asks for these, for these Colossians, I'm asking God, since I found out about you, I haven't stopped asking that you would have a complete knowledge of God's will. Wow, complete knowledge of God's will. So right away, as soon as you say complete knowledge of God's will, what most people are gonna think of is a comprehensive awareness of the detailed plan that God has for my life. God's will is thought of in terms of the practical, tang tangible uh, things of daily life. What do, I put, what do I wear in the morning? What do I eat? Where do I, what do I drive? Where do I drive? What route do I take to work? What, work do I, what job do I work at? Who should I choose as my friends? Who is my spouse? 
Uh, how long do I stay in this state? Should I move in this state or should I move to that state? All these things, people think that's what we're talking about when we talk about a complete knowledge of God's will. No, that's not what we're talking about. God's will is that our lives express the character of God that is revealed in the life of Jesus. Let's say God really had an assignment, but you, you, for whatever reason you missed his voice or whatever, and you lived in the wrong state. Do you think God would still bless you even though you lived in Kansas instead of Texas or whatever? I really, I really do think he, 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 he right, because the, the most important thing in terms of God's will is a life that reflects the character of God as revealed in Jesus. It's not about what toothpaste you use this morning. Oh my goodness, Holy Spirit, which toothpaste should I use, Crest or Colgate? And he probably says, I don't care, brush your teeth, it's your body's your temple of the Holy Spirit, just take good care of it like I care. I don't care which one you use. Like a college kid that's excited to suddenly discern God's will, right? They're, they're, they're getting drunk on the weekends and they're looking at a lot of porno, but they want to make sure that they get the right career because they don't want to miss God's perfect plan for their life. What? Like God cares about your career near as much as he cares about your heart, your intimacy with him, your relationship with him, your obedience to him, your surrender to him, your trust in him. Come on, that's the stuff that has to do with the complete knowledge of God's will. Joke break. I invented a new word, uh, plagiarism. So I got that going for me. The second thing Paul prays for them is this, spiritual wisdom and understanding. So, what is wisdom? Well, we all know that knowledge is a, a comprehensive, factual awareness of information, right? If you have the knowledge, then you have the information. But the ability to apply the information in the current situation, now that's wisdom. In fact, I think my simplest summary of what wisdom is, is wisdom is knowing what to do next. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't know how to apply that knowledge in here and now to the situation that faces you so that your life pleases the Lord, you don't have wisdom. And that's what wisdom is, knowing what to do next. Joke break. So what do you get when you cross a joke with a rhetorical question? And then understanding, that, you know, the proverb says, in all you're getting, whatever else you strive to get, whatever else you're like going after in life, make sure you get understanding. Because if you have understanding, it's going to, it's going to radically transform your life. Because what understanding is, it is seeing life through God's perspective, or seeing life through a renewed mind, or seeing life through a heavenly perspective. Years ago, the Holy Spirit said to me, you know, Tim, the story you're telling about your life is not the story that we're telling in heaven. And I was like, oh my goodness, man, I better, I better press in and figure out and find out from God what is the story, God, that you are telling about my life. Because if I'm believing a different story about my life, I'm probably not uh, going to be living well. Joke break. What do you call a dog who has no legs? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. It really doesn't matter because no matter what you call him, he ain't coming. <laughs> then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. Do you know how many people are interested in trying to figure out if, if, if they can get away with the behavior they want to get away with? It's really obvious that our motives are wrong when, instead of trying to figure out how we, how we can please Jesus the most, we're trying to figure out what the Bible allows us to get away with. What do I have permission to do? How close to the line can I get, right? What, what can I, you know, or, or it's like, it, will this take me to hell? Listen, if you're asking the question, will this take me to hell, instead of how can I best please Jesus, we already know your motives are messed up. Listen, Jesus had more fun than anyone, right? Hebrews 1 says that, that, that he was anointed with the oil of joy more than any of his brethren. So we don't need to think of God as some sort of grumpy person. He invented sex, he invented humor, he invented everything that exists that makes life so cool and so exciting. So I'm not saying that God's grumpy, but what I'm saying is that when we ask the question, what can we get away with instead of how can I please the Lord, our motives are instantly exposed. Joke break. When life gives you melons, you're dyslexic.
and your lives are going to produce every good, every kind of good fruit. Every kind of good fruit. Every kind of good fruit. In other words, you're going to be walking with the reverence and you're going to be staying in the presence of God and Jesus is going to be your real God and you're going to be dwelling in him in such a way that his friendship with you will transform you. You won't be transforming you. You won't be producing good fruit. You will be connected to him. You're staying in this zone. You're staying in the flow of the grace of God and that grace changes. Grace transforms. Grace empowers. Grace is where everything in the whole Christian life is powered by grace and received by faith. When you're doing what you're called to do, you won't even know you're doing it. Explain that a little bit more thoroughly. So for me, that was me trying to feel like I need to, you know, to minister or to do something, you know, for the Lord or do, you know, like, like it always required an action, like a, like a conscious action, but actually you just being who he's made you to be, um, like you, you, you naturally will do the things that, that are in you. Like, like the, like the whole fruit, the, the, the same thing with the tree and the fruit. Tree doesn't try to produce the fruit; it just does. Joke break. This one hits a little too close to home. So, I uh, woke up in the middle of the night, and there was a thief that had broken into my house, and he was desperately searching, looking everywhere for money. So I, I joined him. <laughs> okay. So all the while you will grow. All the while you will grow. All the while you will grow. Most of us talk about life moving in seasons, like there's flat line seasons, and then there's like, there's good seasons, and there's bad seasons, and there's flat line seasons. I'm going to move a little bit. Don't believe the lie that says in some seasons you're going to be growing, but in other seasons you're just going to be going dormant. Don't, don't believe that lie. Some things might go dormant, but you'll still be growing. Another consequence of these two things he wants. You're going to learn to know God. Knowing God is the one thing that burns in our belly. Knowing God is our one thing. Knowing God is what we're about. Knowing God is why we come to church. Knowing God is why we sing. Knowing God is why we pray. Knowing God is why we read our Bible. Knowing God is why we get up in the morning. Knowing God is why we exist. This is it, man. If anything else you're living for is more important to you than knowing God, it's a graven image, it's an idol, it's a golden calf, and it's, and it's a threat to your walk with God. It's a threat to your existence. It's a threat to your basic existential being. It might be Christian stuff. It might have Bible verses tacked onto it. But all that stuff is Jesus' competition, man. All that stuff. Ministry itself can be Jesus' competition. Look at Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. You know, Martha says angrily at Jesus. She's worried and upset about many things. And she says, tell Mary to help me. What was the competition to knowing Jesus? It was serving Jesus. Now it's going, now it's fading. Now see, look, now, see how much it changed? Now it's got to compensate. Oh, I think I'm going to switch. I'm going to switch windows. I'm going to switch windows. That's what I'm going to do. Here we go. I'm going to switch windows. Joke break. So when I say the words receding hairline to you, are you like me? Do you picture a row of rabbits slowly jumping backwards? Yeah, you do? It's good to know we're both normal. We're both really normal. Totally normal. And last part. As you know God better and better, better and better, better and better. So better and better. We love to see people in first love, but we kind of think to ourselves as soon as we see it, well, that can't last. You can't sustain first love your whole life. Well, but this passage says that all the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. How does being in love with Jesus growing really well and then all of a sudden not being in love, as in love with Jesus, how does that fit with all the while you will grow and your lives will fill, be filled with every kind of good fruit and you're going to learn to know God better and better? How does that, it doesn't fit is how. What I'm trying to say is that belief that says you have to lose your first love is a lie. I don't care who you are. When where you are, you might be able to see out over the horizon this, this vast space of beauty and things to explore in the Lord. If you explore all that and you reach that horizon line, the furthest point you can see, then when you reach that horizon line, what's going to unfold before you is a new vista, equally as magnificent and vast and deep and glorious and beautiful as the one you see. And if you reach the one after that, the same thing's going to continue to happen. I don't care how good he is in your mind, he's far better than that. He's far better than that. Joke break. If you, uh, if you put a vest on an alligator, is is that an investigator? No, it's not. Seems like it should be. Now I just want to talk for a little bit about the causal chain. If you get these two things, if you get these two things, complete knowledge of God's will and spiritual wisdom and understanding, then it will lead to four consequences. And here's the four con consequences. Number one, you will always honor and please the Lord. Your lives will always honor and please the Lord. Number two, 
you're going to bear every kind of good fruit. Number three, you're going to grow the whole time. And number four, you're going to learn to know God better and better. That's amazing, right? So Paul's like, I'm only asking for two things right here. Complete knowledge of God's will and spiritual wisdom and understanding, knowing that if you get those two things, you, then, then the fourth, these four things are going to happen. All, you're always going to honor and please the Lord. Every kind of fruit is going to be born. All the while you're going to grow and you're going to know God better and better. So here's the question I have for you. Do you want those things in your life? <laughs> Do you want your life to always honor and please Jesus? Do you want all, every kind of spiritual fruit in your life? Uh, do you want to grow your whole life, to be growing in Christ your whole life? And do you want to know God better and better and better and better and never go backwards and always go forwards? Well, if you do, you can trace back those things. You can trace back those things to little Paul, whom they never even met, asking God to give them those things. Which hits me with this final concluding point. Your prayers are powerful, man. Your prayers, your prayers, your prayers are powerful. Your prayers are powerful. The main thing you can do for somebody else is pray. Sometimes we think, all I can do is pray. That's pretty lame. There's a lot of situations that I don't care what you do, you're not capable of fixing it. Jesus is the one who does the heavy lifting. We get to be the little people who do the praying. God has chosen to work through the prayers of his people. In terms of why? Well, I have a theory. He's a father and he wants a family. He wants children who've grown up into his image that he co-labors with. His primary goal is relationship. If he wanted something done, he could have just, you know, snapped his fingers and got it done. But he's interested in relationship with people who freely cooperate with him. Two more jokes for the road. You know what I've noticed about kleptomaniacs is that even if you try, you cannot explain puns to them because they just take everything literally. <laughs> I like that one. It's a good one. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, so this uh, Buddhist monk walks up to a hot dog vendor and says, uh, make, me, uh, make me one with everything. <laughs>